is again. Oh, that's a fat. That's a big fish. Here, Hobart, will you take the rod so I can release him, please? Okay. Okay. Keep the, rest. Keep the tip up, bud. Yep. Huge. Okay. Huge. Huge. In this episode of Northwest Outdoors, join Mike Lombard of Portland Fishing Adventures and Hobart Mans as they go after sturgeon on the Columbia River. Now that's, that's, uh-oh, uh-oh. Hobart has another camp recipe. This time it's apple glaze sausage. Something new to the outdoors. Where do you suppose the oldest Jeep club in the world is? It's the Ridge Runners in Yakima. Go Jeepin' on your Northwest Outdoors. Funding of Northwest Outdoors is made possible in part by O'Loughlin Sports Shows. Puyallup, Portland and the Redmond Sports Shows are proud supporters of public television throughout the Northwest, placing an emphasis on education for the great outdoors. By Kershaw Knives of Portland, Oregon. Makers of precision tools and cutlery, Kershaw Knives continues to support outdoor programming and outdoor activities throughout the Pacific Northwest and by Northwest Dock Systems of Eatonville, Washington. Manufacturers of Herb's pontoon boats, Northwest Dock Systems supports safe and environmentally responsible enjoyment of the outdoors. Just have to wait for him to take it down. He was really hammering it too. Ooh, that was violent. Yeah. He's gonna take that. <gasps> got him, absolutely got him. Yes, he's on there. Time to go to work again. We are in the zone for big Columbia River sturgeon. Northwest Outdoors fishing host Hobart Manns and Portland fishing adventure guide Mike Lombard recently spent some time matching strengths against some of the strongest fish in the world. This is a, quite, a, quite a surging fish. You notice okay, I'm not you're trying drifting, to do Hob. it. Huh? You're drifting right now, buddy. Gotcha. You, us and him are going about the same speed, and he isn't even, he hasn't even started to get serious about anything. <laughs> it's like having snagged the bottom and you expect it to go someplace, and it's not gonna go. Well, we didn't take very long this morning to get that first hook up, what was it, about 15, 20 minutes? About 15. Yeah. I think uh, scent on your hands, you know, I was washing my hands in the shed before we started, I think scent's probably, you know, one main reason that get a consistent no, catch I, down here. I believe in that, I really do. For sport fishing fans, this stretch of the Columbia on the Washington and Oregon border is prime real estate for sturgeon of all sizes. Historically, white sturgeon was abundant in the Columbia River and in the late 1800s supported an intense commercial fishery. White sturgeon populations in the Columbia River, particularly this one downstream from the Bonneville Dam, recovered sufficiently from the overfishing of the late 1800s and now support important recreational and commercial fisheries. The population of white sturgeon in the lower Columbia River is one of the largest in the world. Does that feel real heavy? Huh? Well, I can't tell what it feels like because it doesn't lift much. It's just... Uh, 312 pounds. No, nah, <laughs> no. Nah. That's a heavy fish, okay? Yeah. Isn't it, Hobart? Yes, it huh? is. <laughs> Because we're right straight over him and he doesn't lift. And he doesn't, he doesn't already lift, does he? Keeper sturgeon are fun when they're biting, but the oversized sturgeon can test a person's will and endurance. I'm willing to bet that fish is well in excess of 400 pounds. Uh, probably only 50, 60. The head's probably, the head's probably about this long, about that round. But I'll tell you what, he's probably only about 10 or 11 inches between the eyes, Hobart, okay? <laughs> The part that bothers me yeah. is that he hasn't made a run yet. Ooh, you, did you feel that? Oh yeah. That he, was him rolling, boy. He, He's a roller, isn't he? A little head shaking going on. Ooh. He don't like that mouth being turned up. Uh-uh. Watch it, watch the problem. You know, 
I'll tell you, he's probably about three, three and a quarter. 325 pounds and probably 11 feet long. There's, hello there, big fella. Now we can't take this fish out of the water, so we're gonna have a little trouble trying to cut that hook off in anyway. Well, I'll get him. But uh, how long do you suppose that fish is, Mike? Oh. Look, look at the size of that mouth and those feelers. Okay, just bring him this way right here. There you go. Get that ball off of this. Yeah, so I'm gonna probably get conked in the head, yeah. Good idea. Put your thumb on a spool, I'm gonna gun the motor, we're gonna drag him up and get a lengthwise pitcher. Okay. You got it? Pull back just a little bit, home if you can. Try I've to stretch him up. Got as much of it there as I There you go. Oh, about eight, eight and a half foot, and I'd say right at, right about 325 pounds. Oh, uh, I'll bet he's closer to nine. Nine foot? Why, certainly. Okay. Uh oh, he's reviving. Uh, just stand there, just like arc the pole this way towards me. Okay. I'll grab the Dacron leader. Mike's okay. gonna release this. Okay, fish now probably. hold pressure, please. Gotcha. Hold. Yeah, we're gonna leave the hook in there. Okay. Gotcha. I'm gonna release him. Goodbye, big fella, and thank you. Have a nice day, Mr. Sturge. Oh. Another one to the boat. Good job. Lombard has been hauling in giant sturgeon for his clients for many years. He says if you want big fish, you need a big bait. Now that's a decent sized young shad that you're gonna use in here, probably about a pound, pound and a quarter. Uh-huh, yeah. Whole bait. Show me yep. how you're gonna rig that up. Well, I start I, and I notch the tail on both sides with a knife, like this. I start there for that, like that. And I start with a hook, being the sturgeon to take the bait head first. I start back here at the tail with a hook. And I go through the fish like this, through the shad. Completely through like that. And I go up here behind the head one time, completely through with a hook. And I go right down through the top of the, the nose, Hobart, right here with a hook. And right out the bottom of the mouth. It's the toughest part of the fish right there. And then I pull the eye of the hook right in there solid like that and leave the hook staying out like that. Just draw her up tight. And that slot back there by the tail that I cut is for the half hitch. That holds everything in place. Quick, sweet, and simple. Yeah, it is. And it stays on the hook pretty good. The first thing you notice when you're with a river guide is their concern for safety. In the past two decades, there have been many capsizes and a couple drownings on the Columbia River. Mike stresses how important it is for proper anchoring while fishing the deep, fast-flowing Columbia. What, I'm, what I've got out here is a 60-pound anchor, uh, including about 10 foot of chain on it, 350 foot of rope with a, you know, with a with a big buoy and then a and a, and a float buoy on it. I'm away and I've got enough angle on my rope that I don't, you know, if a, if a wave does come by or whatnot that I've got enough room to, you know, move with the wave, whereas some people come out here with too much shorter rope and whatnot, uh, Hobe, and, uh, you know, they get anchored straight down at an angle, and when a wave comes by or, or a log or something's coming down the river and hits our anchor rope, it sucks the bow down, and they sink. And when I saw you drop out 350 feet of line, the safety factor on line is something like you need seven to one over the depth, so we're probably in 50, 60 feet of water, and you've got 350 feet of line and the average person comes down into this river to fish should consider to have two to 400 feet of line on board if you need it. Especially up here this time of year when late April comes and you know on through about the end of July, early August uh, when the water's high here in the Columbia, you, you really in this particular area up here, uh, or I really tell you the truth anywhere in the Columbia, the whole river's high, uh, you, you want at least three to 400 feet of rope, anchor rope. What, what you've done here, Mike, is that you've okay, go ahead. hooked a buoy on with a downrigger clip, and that's going to carry that 48-ounce sinker and our bait out the, the distance that you want it. That's right. Then we're going to release, release uh -huh. it. There's another one of those pieces of uh, log out there that if you're not paying attention to, could certainly raise havoc with an 
Have a nice day. An anchor rope, yes. You find more of that comes inside in the, or outside the channel. That's the main uh, feed path of the river. You're in it right now, as far as I'm concerned. The way the river turns up there and the current turns and all that. Yep. I'd say from where you're sitting out, 40, 50 yards is probably the main where the fish migrate. Most of that is where the uh, debris, debris is. is going also. Yeah. Down there far enough, yeah. flick it in, and we'll take up a little slack. And there she worked. This time it came loose. What'll happen first? You'll be on the bottom before I get this in. You're on the bottom now. Pretty close. Pretty close. Just hit the bottom right there, Hope. 60, 80 feet of water? Yeah, about uh, 80. Yeah? Yeah, it's peeling off the reel. Let's. There he is. Oh, you snagged the bottom again, Mike. Pull the bag, start the little motor. Up on the throttle. Yep. Bow up on the big engine. I'll get the other. Got us up. another hook up here today. Another hog sturge. What did that take? About 15 minutes in the water, wasn't it? That yep. bait, and then we had another hook up. Yep. That was a pretty good deal. You know, Hobart, I really appreciate you letting me do this today. Very seldom do I ever get to, you know, hook and land with these hogs myself. Now you're going to see what kind of punishment you put us through all the time. <laughs> Ooh, that's a heavy fish. Yeah, it is. Yes, it is. Oh, trim it more. That's good. We're free. Okay. Well, you know, uh, you know, if you want to get some fish to take home on light tackle, uh, March and April are a real good time. Part of, well, mid-February, March and April. And then November, December is another good time for keeper stirs on light tackle. Then the big ones are pretty much late April and through the month of uh, July into early August, you can get these big fish up here. You got him off the bottom quick, though. He's gonna go back down. Now it's where you hold on and uh, you say shucky darn while he runs off all yeah. that line yeah, that have you just nice got in. <laughs> jerk, jerk, jerk. Good heavens. <laughs> well, that's living proof that you can't break that rod. Yep. Yeah. Look at that fish's pressure. Mike, how, how much is that rod rated for? Uh, the rod is uh, rated 80 to 100 pound class tackle. Salt water? Yeah, basically. Tuna rod. Yeah. Basically. And, and that is a bigger than normal reel. It's a pan 340 level line. Got a 100 pound line on it. And how many yards will it hold? Oh, about 400. Of all the places that we've been to or that we know about, perhaps outside of Russia or Europe or somewhere. This sturgeon fishery in the gorge here is as good as any place. Is there any real reason for it or is it just? Oh, there's a couple. If you ever heard anybody say anything good about the fishery management, you're hearing it now. They're doing a fine job managing the sturgeon. Uh, the other thing is that is that we get a, a migratory group of sturgeon twice a year. We get them in January and February and they migrate in with the uh, smell, the keepers. And then these oversized fish are just starting to migrate in right now, uh, feeding and spawning up in this area. Sturgeon don't use the fish ladders at the dams, so this migratory group from the ocean stop at this first dam up here, Bonneville Dam, and they congregate in, I'd say, the, this last 10 miles of river below the dam in pretty good quantity. And they've also decided, finally, that they're going to protect them during that spawn period. That's right. That's a good idea. They've got uh, this area closed from uh, that big rock up there in the foreground you guys can see. Beacon Rock to the dam, May 1st to June 30th, during the height of the spawn, which was another real good management decision. That way, there's, you know, those fish that are spawning up there, leave them alone. Fine. Oh, my. Serious work. This is for all the anglers you've taken out here in all these years, Mike. We're getting even. <laughs> there he is. 
That's a big fish. Here, Holbar, will you take the rod so I can release him, please? Okay. Okay. So keep, the rest, keep the tip up, bud. Yep. Huge. Okay. Huge. Huge. I'll gun the motor. What I'm going to do is stretch him out for you. Put your thumb on the spool. We'll do the same thing again, Hope. Gotcha. Got it? Ready? Take the rod tip out that way. Yeah. Now that's, that's, uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> oh. Uh oh no. no. Okay, reel down the swivel, bud. That he's, uh, he's not ready. He was ready, but we gave him his head again, see? <laughs> what I think about this surgeon fishing is serious work. Real serious work. For a person who's never experienced this, I would say that you should do it at least once or twice in your lifetime to say that you've done it. He's just about up. There's a swivel. A lot of pressure. A lot of pressure on his head. There you go. You drop cool. it right on your nose. By God, he's he's gonna go again, isn't he? Huh? Well, he's certainly thinking about it. That's the most serious. I say he's 350, 375 pounds. What do you think? Yeah. What serious fish I've ever felt. And I can get him second hand. <laughs> Here you go, home. Turning. Yep. Yeah, here's one about about nine and a half foot, about 350, 375 pounds, I hope. Looks like a plumber down there. Yeah. Quite the quite the sink he's got here. Okay, take the hook and the bit and the lead away. Yeah, I'm going to. I want you to get a good picture of this one, Rick, when I release him. I, I, I would like to see everybody release sturgeon like this in this fishery. What you do is you just turn them over like this, folks. And just let them swim down. See the fish swim away. Turn him over and he'll go right down. Hey, good job, Hobart. Thank you, Mike. You but bet. The, but you gotta understand, the good job is putting the right bait on with the right guide and being in the right place. Thank you, thank you. And you did that. Let's go get another one. With, with me, it's just simply a matter of hanging on and praying. <laughs> Here's one of Northwest Outdoors' favorite cooking recipes the next time you're in camp. Try apple glazed sausage. If you're out camping and you want to do something a little on the gourmet side that will surprise your guests or the people camping with you, a day or two before you go camping, take some bratwurst and boil them until they're done in apple juice. Put them in a plastic bag and take them in the field with you under refrigeration. Now, in the skillet over here, we have additional apple juice currently cooking. We're going to add our pre-cooked bratwurst sausage and what's going to happen here happens very fast as the bratwurst heat they give off a little bit of oil and that oil will combine with the remaining apple juice which is reducing under this hot fire uh, that you see bubbling here as it gets down close to total evaporation the oil and the apple juice will form a caramelization that will coat these bratwurst these can be served with sauerkraut or with uh, fried potatoes of some nature or whatever else you might like to have in camp. But it all happens in about 45 seconds. And once it gets down to the place where it turns a sticky glaze, there's a moment that it will adhere to the sausage before it starts burning in the pan. So you have to be pretty careful and pretty attentive, staying on top of it, turning them. You can see it's evaporating now and it's it's almost disappearing. The bubbling's going down to the place where there's not much left. When that it totally evaporates, it's time to take them out of there because it goes quickly. And they are ready because when all the bubbling quits in the pan, it gets sticky and they are done. Beautiful. Nice coating on them. We're gonna put them on this little cookie sheet here with a towel to dry them for just a moment. See this remaining caramelization here. See how it sticks to the uh, bratwurst? Gives it a great apple flavor. Just absolutely great. See how it changed color in just a moment as you roll it through the caramelization? Again, just roll them through that. Gorgeous. Try this in your camp. The guys will love you for bringing something new to the outdoors. Here's the recipe for you to try apple glazed sausage the next time you're in camp.
we're deep in the woods some 30 miles west of Yakima, near the town of Tampico, Washington. This is the annual gathering of the Pacific Northwest Four-Wheel Drive Association. Here, owners of four-wheel drive vehicles come together to compare rides, have fun, and compete with each other in various events. The Ridge Runners, a four-wheel drive Jeep club from Yakima, sponsors the event. The Yakima Ridge Runners is a strictly Jeep-only club. You have to have a Jeep. Be it as uh, an old flat fender or a CJ7 or a CJ5, it has to be a Jeep. There are other members of the Pacific Northwest Four-Wheel Drive Association that are open to all kinds of uh, four-wheel drive rigs. So this weekend, for example, out here, you'll see everything from uh, Broncos and Blazers and pickups and flatbed Toyotas and uh, you name it, and there's about any combination you can possibly think of. Lee McClanathan has been jeeping with the Ridge Runners for a number of years. He states this is a sport that any family can be involved with. We've got everything from mechanics to engineers to equipment operators to salesmen to business owners. Uh, it runs a full gamut of people that uh, enjoy the outdoors. Primarily it's somebody who likes, uh, is, enjoys Jeeps, enjoys four-wheeling, enjoys automotive mechanic. You have to do a lot of your own mechanicing because it gets expensive. But it's a family-oriented club. I mean, we have a nice facility here, a park that we've built up over the last 40 years uh, where we can come on the weekends and have a nice place to camp and put on events like this for people. One event everybody looks forward to is the weekend poker run. Poker run is basically uh, about a three-hour journey up through the mountains on some uh, Jeep trails where, and with various checkpoints. At each one of the checkpoints, you'll get a uh, playing card and whoever comes back with the best uh, best poker hand will win half the whatever's in the pot. Getting from checkpoint to checkpoint can be quite a challenge on this rough terrain and a lot of fun. There are a number of Jeep clubs around the Northwest, but Yakima's Ridge Runner Jeep Club is considered the first such club in the world. Former Yakima resident Wally Klingel started this club after World War II. The veterans came back from World War II, of which Wally was a U.S. Marine, and he used to do this with his cars. And then he decided that, man, those Jeeps they invented in World War II was the thing. So he bought one, and about 10 other people bought them as soon as they could get them in 45, 46, 7, and 8. They incorporated the Jeep Club in 47 and uh, put a total membership of 40 members. And it just, it was great. It was the only four-wheel drive vehicle. There were a few pickups, but nothing like the universal four-wheel, four-by-four Jeep. I got involved with this club when I was uh, back in my days of radio because I used to announce there used to be a huge mud race here uh, at this park and it was became one of the biggest events in the Northwest. Uh, during those times I, got, I started uh, getting interested in Jeeps and my uh, wife, uh, her father was a member and I used to go on runs and ride along with him and I just enjoyed it. I enjoyed being up in the outdoors. It was peaceful. It was uh, beautiful scenery. I love the scenery. People have a misconception about uh, environmental damage. Uh, I mean, the Jeepers are, you know, we don't want to tear things up. I mean, we have this club, the Ridge Runners, we have trails that have been in existence for uh, 50 years, trails that, have, that are now most of the Forest Service roads uh, and state roads up here above Tampa Cove were originally Ridge Runner trails. Uh, we care about the environment. If you go up, once you get up in the hills and you start seeing what uh, environmental damage is done by strip logging, and some of the uh, logging outfits as compared are far more detrimental to the environment than anything done by uh, 
uh, off-roaders and four-wheelers. I mean, what gets uh, publicity is the damage of a few, but if you look at the numbers of people that use the woods, it's use the woods sensibly, carry out your garbage, pick up your garbage. You know, we really care about it because we spend a lot of time up there. If you enjoy jeeping or want to learn how to go jeeping, there are a number of clubs you can join. The Ridge Runners have a few tips for those who want to learn. Find a friend or two that'll go with you because going alone is not good. Then you got to have pretty nice equipment. Uh, you, you don't have to buy brand new, but you have to buy stuff that you can repair and have a good vehicle. And then the only other thing to learn it is to do it. I mean, you can talk about it and, and you get out there and you get the feel of it. How, how, how side hill is a side hill? How steep's up, how steep's down? And you learn to do all this, and, and uh, it's fun. Learn about more ways you can enjoy the outdoors by going online with Northwest Outdoors. Click on www.northwestoutdoors.org. Learn more about this show field reports, outdoor recipes, and a lot more by going to www.northwestoutdoors.org. Funding of Northwest Outdoors is made possible in part by O'Loughlin Sports Shows. Puyallup, Portland and the Redmond Sports Shows are proud supporters of public television throughout the Northwest, placing an emphasis on education for the great outdoors. By Kershaw Knives of Portland, Oregon. Makers of precision tools and cutlery, Kershaw Knives continues to support outdoor programming and outdoor activities throughout the Pacific Northwest and by Northwest Dock Systems of Eatonville, Washington. Manufacturers of Herb's pontoon boats, Northwest Dock Systems supports safe and environmentally responsible enjoyment of the outdoors. <laughs>